Welcome to the podcast about Norbert Müller, German historian, Olympic expert, member of IOC commissions, president of the International Pierre de Coubertin Committee, chief of protocol in the Olympic Village at the Games in Munich 1972, professor at the Johannes Gutenberg University, later at the University of Kaiserslautern. He played a long-standing leading role in the German and in the International Olympic Academy. He was deputy director of the International Study Program, Olympic Studies, member of the Lay Council of the Vatican, father of three children, grandpa and companion of many people who are engaged in and fascinated by the Olympic movement. We will talk about the heritage of Norbert, but also about the future, about Olympic knowledge, Olympic education and Olympic culture. And the first person who we will listen to is Norbert, talking about the question how Coubertin managed to bring the Olympics to Athens. Das 1896 Spiele gerade kamen, hängt damit zusammen, dass der Coubertin 1889 erste Anregungen bekam über die Ausgrabung von Olympia. That the games happened just in 1896 is linked with Coubertin's first impressions about the excavations of Olympia in Greece. At the World Exhibition 1889 in Paris, many pictures were shown there. In addition, Coubertin heard lectures about the excavations of Olympia, his knowledge about the excavation, the knowledge about about the reintroduction of the body into the education of the youth and thus body, mind and soul as a unity consolidated his Olympic idea. In 1894, Coubertin then organized the Congress for amateur regulations and simply added the refoundation of the Olympic Games. After a vote, it was adopted. But quite honestly, no one understood what he wanted, so that he ultimately had to make the first Games a success, because without success, the first Games, the project would have completely failed. Companions in the podcast, let's talk about Olympic knowledge, education and culture, the heritage and perspectives of Norbert Müller are Maria Bogner, head of the IOC Olympic Study Center. She says Professor Dr. Norbert Müller was undoubtedly one of the most knowledgeable and recognized scholar and ambassador of Olympic education within the IOC, the Olympic family, and of course towards his students. His publications on the history of the IOC and Coubertin's writings remain key references for researchers around the world. Hello, Maria. Hello, nice to be with you. We have Professor Stefan Vassong. Professor Vassong is head of the Institute of Sport History and director of the Olympic Studies Center at the German Sport University in Cologne. He's member of the IOC's Olympic Education Commission and president of the International Pierre de Coubertin Committee. Stefan says Professor Dr. Norbert Müller or Norbert was an authentic personality in private and professional life. His profound knowledge on the Olympic movement in general and Olympic education, history, ethics and the life and ideas of Pierre de Coubertin in particular coined Olympic studies. Without a doubt, this should be followed to disseminate a complete understanding of the Olympic movement and its connection to society. Hello, Stefan. Hi, good afternoon to all of you and thanks for having me. We have Christian Wacker. Dr. Christian Wacker has been director of two Olympic museums and currently works at Qatar Museums, president of the International Society of Olympic Historians. Norbert had been an Olympic Universalist, he says, his occupations were both research and, above all, the dissemination of Olympic knowledge. He did this with great intensity together with his students. He organized exhibitions, he sought the media and even supported excavations. His enthusiasm for Olympic issues was contradictious and I openly admit to having been infected with this virus, Olympism, through Norbert. Hello, Christian. 
Hello, everybody. I'm happy to join the group. And we have Kostas Georgiadis, professor at the University for Olympism and dean of the IOA International Olympic Academy, University of Olympism of the Peloponnese. Thank you very much. Great okay. pleasure to be with all of you. Okay, you're a member in the IOC Commission of Olympic Education and you are vice president of the National Society of Olympic Historians. We are all companions. My name is Holger Kühner. I'm a journalist and we are going through the life and the perspectives of Norbert Müller. He was born December 9th in 1946 and he died on February 16th, 2022. Let's talk about Norbert Müller, who he was. And I would say we start with one of his uh, successors at the International Pierre de Coubertin Committee with Stefan in uh, Cologne. Who was Norbert? Norbert was um, my teacher. He supervised my PhD and my habilitation. And after that, we uh, became colleagues and above all, very close friends. He clearly coined my academic thinking and my way of doing research. So I owe a lot to him and I can certainly testify his tireless efforts to share his knowledge and to pass on his interest in the Olympic movement and on Olympic uh, studies to others. So let's go to, to Maria. She is in Lausanne, one of the most famous places for everything that is connected with the Olympics. And I think Norbert also liked this place, Lausanne, because he knew that uh, Pierre de Coubertin brought the IOC to, to Lausanne. What is your impression about Norbert and, and his work left in Lausanne and the Olympic movement? Well, Norbert, for, for the IOC and, and for all the people that we deal with at the Olympic Study Center, was clearly recognized as one of the most emblematic personalities of the academic community, who dedicated his large part for the scientific research and the promotion of Olympic education and studies. Specifically, the significance of Pierre de Coubertin's writings and the value of Olympism was always in the center of his efforts. And, and um, as we said, for, for really sharing this knowledge with the professionals, professionals with, with students, and with, um, with obviously his peers to inspire other people to understand fully the meaning and the, the purpose of the Olympic movement and the vision that Coubertin had when he founded the modern Olympic Games. So, yeah, throughout his life, he really touched and influenced many. As a university professor, it was already mentioned at the beginning, you know, he shared the knowledge with his, his students and peers as president of the Curatorium for the Olympic Academy of Germany. Um, his focus was more on the youth athletes, uh, young athletes and um, schools. And as the president of the International Peter Coubertin Committee, um, he was renowned and recognized experts. And he was, as it was also mentioned, advisor and member of diverse committees in international organizations, including, of course, the International Olympic Committee. So when we think about uh, Norbert's legacy, it's, it's as you said, uh, knowledge, Olympic education, culture. When I think of all the books he's published, all the exchanges we've had on these topics, all the opportunities to hear and be inspired and learn from him is really these three topics that coin uh, the memories that we have. So we were in Cologne, we went to Lausanne, and I would say let's jump to Olympia, where Kostas is at the International Olympic Academy. At the funeral of, of Norbert, at the end of February, they had a, a huge picture of him standing in, in the church and the picture showed him um, with a book, The Olympic Idea, and it showed ancient Olympia. This is a place where he felt very comfortable. What's your impression, Costas, just having the view about the valley of Alphaios when you think about Norbert? The legacy of Norbert Miller, you can feel that here in the academy in every step, His relationship with the International Olympic Academy started in 1968, while still was a student. 
and his doctoral thesis, as we know, uh, was on the materialization of Pierre de Coubertin's thoughts and uh, the activities through the activities of the International Olympic Academy, which created a really strong uh, bond between him and the International Olympic Academy. As a distinguished uh, professor and uh, historian uh, of the modern Olympic movement at the Johannes Gutenberg University, where I have also uh, studied, uh, he published numerous uh, books and publications uh, from high academic quality on the writings on Baron Pierre de Coubertin, but also in, for the history of the International Olympic Academy, including summaries of the lectures of the young participant uh, session, but also on Olympic education uh, related and connected always with the work of the International uh, Olympic uh, Academy. His passionate support for the International Olympic Academy was based on uh, the deep uh, and thorough knowledge uh, around uh, the establishment of uh, IOA and its humanistic uh, goals, uh, because he was here for many times and he, he was feeling uh, that. At uh, the IOA, we have also seen how Norbert Müller managed to transmit Olympic education uh, to the students as life experience, an experience that uh, goes uh, way be beyond the knowledge uh, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, uh, research and uh, uh, taught. He was a man of unfailing ideas. Uh, he had been passionate supporter of the, of the creation of the Olympic seminar for postgraduate students. Actually, we started it uh, together in 1993. We worked together from 1992, uh, which opened the doors of the academy to the, the academic community. And we know that uh, many of them later created the Olympic Studies Center uh, at their universities. At the same time, he was a warm supporter of all educational activities uh, of the IOA and one of the most uh, regular lecturers at the IOA session, especially in the postgraduate uh, seminar. Uh, moreover, he also organized different other educational activities with the National Olympic Academy of Germany, where he uh, uh, was the president uh, for some time, but also seminars with uh, students from different universities, German universities uh, around Germany. Uh, they, were, they, they came uh, in regular time here in Olympia, uh, but also seminars with uh, National Olympic Academies uh, from different countries to discuss current educational uh, problems related with Olympic education. And he was always surrounded by, by young people, as you said, Costas. Um, I have a picture. Yes. I have a picture in mind. Um, Norbert and students in the backyard of ancient um, Olympia looking for the Hippodrome. Um, he was interested yes. in excavations. Um, we heard Norbert talking about Pierre de Coubertin, and I sometimes have the have the problem to to um, um, to check if Coubertin is speaking or if Norbert Müller is speaking. Um, talking about excavations, Christian. You mentioned that in, in, in your statement, um, the link between Coubertin and Norbert Müller and seeing Norbert in the backyard of, of ancient Olympia looking for the Hippodrome, he was always dynamic and that was a vivid Olympic movement. Um, what's your impression about working together with him? Only to illustrate what um, Costa mentioned, Costa's mentioned right now regarding um, regarding the passion of of, of educating 
I would like to recount a short story. And this is also the story where I got to meet uh, Norbert the first time more than 30 years ago. Um, I'm not a sport. Um, I'm not a, a sports scientist. I'm uh, by education an archaeologist, and I used to work in ancient Olympia. So during um, during one of those days where I had been inside the excavation site, I recognized a group of students um, with um, with a professor sitting below an olive tree, and this was around eight o'clock eight o'clock in the morning. And uh, the professor started to teach. At nine o'clock, he continued to teach. And um, the sun, the sun was rising, and it's it's getting hotter. And um, the professor became more and more animated. And the end of the story was that I approached the group about five hours after the professor started to teach, and I asked them about the passion. And this is exactly the passion which was so typical about Norbert. And this was when, when I got to know him. So many years later, um, we um, we designed a project together to um, to excavate um, or let's say to to um, um, to research the ancient hippodrome in Olympia. So and uh, Norbert was uh, much more than um, a scholar and teacher at the universities. He disseminated his knowledge through different channels. So one of the channels was he wanted to get to know the location of ancient uh, of, 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 of the hippodromos in ancient Olympia. He organized the money. We organized a group of uh, geophysicists who uh, should do the research. And Norbert personally came to Olympia together with his students. And he helped the specialists uh, uh, to, to discover the hippodrome in Olympia. At the end, the academic result um, is not 100% convincing, but this story only shows us how far Norbert could go in order to capture new research, in order to create new knowledge. And he was, I would say, he was um, very unusual in uh, the approaches which he took. So he wanted some research, he wanted to discover something, and he did it. So we are talking about unusual aspects of the Olympic movement, talking in the podcast, let's talk about Olympic knowledge, education and culture, the heritage and perspectives of Norbert Müller. We are talking with Maria Bogner from the International Olympic Committee in Lausanne with Kostas Georgiadis, professor uh, from the International Olympic Academy with Christian Wacker in Qatar and with Stefan Vassong from the German Sports University in Cologne. Talking to Norbert Müller, for me as a journalist, is always the, the question how to talk to young people about knowledge and education and culture if if we start with the with the part of the the knowledge which is very important um, for under, understanding the history of the olympic movement and the the challenges um, which the olympic movement also today um, is is confrontated stefan um, talking about the knowledge, uh, maybe the, the know-how transfer from Norbert to his students, how did that work with him? Um, let, me, let me start first with, with making some connections. And, and uh, you all talked about uh, uh, Norbert's publications, and I think that his publications, or most of them, clearly mirrors his personality and also his motivation to do research and his addiction to, to uh, um, Olympic studies. We have already mentioned a few of his books. Costas mentioned the, uh, his PhD thesis, which he wrote on, on, the develop, on the foundation and development of the International Olympic Academy and on the, the reports he also edited on, on the, the various sessions um Norman was was definitely widely published and recognized on the national international level and maybe as a first major breakthrough 
his book on the history of the Olympic Congresses, which was published for the first time in, in 1983, uh, received a lot of academic reputation. And um, the book got translated into English by the IOC on the occasion on the Centennial Olympic Congress in Paris in 1994. And Maria said that he was uh, quite often in Lausanne. And uh, this was definitely the case when he researched uh, documents for his book, uh, Text Choisis, Pierre de Coubertin, which he published, by the way, together with his close colleague and friend Otto Schanz. The three volume edition of the French version was published in 1986. And since then, has become a highly valued and widely used reference book for the world at large. And it's so important that in this book, Coubertin is not only portrayed as the, the founder of the modern Olympic movement, but also as an educator, as a philosopher, as a historian. And uh, these texts make a significant contribution to Coubertin's rich literary legacy and led to his renaissance in the academic world. The IOC honored this impressive work and awarded uh, the Olympic order to both, to Norbert and to Otto. Probably, well, the most well-known of Norbert's publication is Olympism, Pierre de Coubertin Selected Writings. Um, the book was edited by the IOC, but with Norbert Müller as the managing uh, editor, it has become a standard work for students and researchers in the fields of Olympic studies. The book with its more than 600 pages has been translated into various languages. And of course, the book and its translations can be found on the website of the International Pierre de Coubertin Committee. And there it can be downloaded. For Coubertin, it, uh, for, for Norbert, it was important to publish a lot about different and various aspects of the Olympic movement. But what was really important for him was to link his research always with educational and ethical considerations. And this is what he, he brought across to his students, that, that we have to link um, the different aspects of the Olympic movement with an educational thinking, because Norbert never tired of stressing that this is really this really coins the uniqueness of the Olympic movement. And Norbert taught us these lessons in a very authentic um, way. I'll be back in, in with the with the publications in 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 a second with you, Stefan. But talking about um, publications, um, the Olympic World Library, um, which is in Lausanne, and and Maria is. Um, Responsible, may I say so, responsible for the Olympic World Library. Um, I checked that and, and did a, a little research about Norbert Müller and you have a lot of books and a, a lot of articles. Um, and because Stefan was talking about the Olympic Congresses, he, he published the book um, after, after the, the Baden-Baden Congress, but then he still was active in writing articles in the Olympic Review, um, what Pierre de Coubertin also did. Um, how productive was he? Um, uh, how, how important was it for him to, to publish his ideas? I think the question is for me, right, Holger? Yeah, right. <laughs> no, definitely. I mean, I think he, he didn't stop uh, producing and writing until, until shortly before his death. It was his life passion and his dedication to put his knowledge onto paper. And he, I think he was very much aware of how important that was and how, um, yeah, how much value his, his um, written knowledge would bring to, um, to all those that, yeah, that clearly refer to it. And, and it's true that we, I can say that for my team for sure, um, as the Olympic Study Center, we of course get um, requests by researchers from around the world on a daily basis uh, and uh, dozens of them and the team itself researches 
uh, a daily on a daily basis about the history of the Olympic movement, the history of the Congress, the decisions of the IOC, etc., um, and and Kubata's thinking and and writing, and a lot of that is found, in fact, in these important uh, publications that Stefan referred to, and I can say without exaggeration that they are probably used on a daily basis. That's just with us. Uh, that's not talking about all other researchers that are also doing the activity. So uh, most definitely. But I can confirm from my personal exchanges with him that he was, um, yeah, very, very open, very generous uh, in this aspect of of sharing his knowledge and wanting uh, it to be available uh, to researchers. So, so um, especially as his his health wasn't so good. He was really in touch with me and sharing a lot of uh, content and, and wanting it to be accessible uh, to researchers uh, via the Olympic Study Center or, or yeah, uh, any means that we could offer him. He was very grateful. And we are just as grateful uh, towards him for this because um, the value is, is immense and it goes without saying that this will really be used to, uh, as a reference for, for many for years to come. Yeah, when you say you're working on a... On on a daily on a daily basis working with students how important um, is it to talk about the the history and and the work like Norbert and and other scientists um, left in the in the Olympic library how important is the the look back to the history for the knowledge well without history we have no future the history shapes our future and um I think we see that uh, on a daily basis, and, and I think we can all refer to it, uh, that, that Olympic history is something not only for students and, and researchers. Olympic history fascinates a whole big group of people, and um, everyone has a certain memory about the Olympic Games. Everyone has a certain connection, and people are, we get requests from all, all kinds of uh, people, be it um, in uh, in, in the, I would say, students, academic, educators, also journalists, also uh, content creators that are writing something. And it's a topic that um, is something that is universal and, and its history um, remains interesting and extremely um, diverse uh, and, and, and um, yeah, Something that that uh, it's it's preservation and the importance of understanding the history also and having a deep uh, analysis is something that not only Coubertin wanted himself, which is why he said um, a center of Olympic studies will preserve my thinking more than anything else, which is also the reason why the IOA was born in Olympia and uh, Olympic study centers uh, fulfill this mission basically. Um, But it also coins back into what you said before about this experience. Coubertin had also said that um, not only the games should inspire the world and, and be this educational platform every four years when the games are held. It should be um, Olympic education and studies should be in permanent factories. And these permanent factories are in the schools, in the sports clubs, with the youth camps, etc. And Norbert Müller really knew how to bring exactly that to life because his teaching was as Christian alluded to so so nicely really experience based and that's how he touched and and woke the passion in people because he always knew it's not only in the classroom that people learn it's actually this other much deeper experiences that people um, get inspired with Olympism and what it means. And that's why he was eager of bringing people to Olympia. That's why he was organizing youth camps to go to, to the games. Um, and, and that's how he really transformed um, his knowledge in, in the most uh, powerful way to his students. And I'm envying all these colleagues with me today in this podcast who have actually, as you, benefited from being inspired in this experimental way by him. Um, I unfortunately only got to know him uh, when I was already in my professional life and, and much later, but uh, I envy all of you for having experienced that um, and, and having that aspect of, of Norbert. Mentioning mentioning the colleagues, I got a, a signal from Cologne, from Stefan and then from Costas in, in Olympia. Stefan, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really perfect what Maria said, because this clearly characterized uh, Norbert's academic 
activities. Um, Norbert always stressed the importance to or yeah to leave the so-called uh, academic ivory tower. Uh, it, it was important for him to make a significant contribution, what has become well known today as research-led learning. So, so he, he worked with his students on the text and analyzed them in seminars and lectures. And by this, uh, he, he stirred uh, our interest uh, and the interest of numerous other students in, in Olympic studies. This was the fact when he was talking about Olympic education, about uh, historical aspects of the Olympic movement. But when I recalled some comments of my students from the MA Olympic studies, when Normand started talking about the Olympic Games in 1972, this was really on a very interesting and, and field and a very emotional field for him and he came across in, in his teaching in a very authentic way. Uh, Holger, you mentioned at the beginning that Norbert himself was the head of protocol at the Olympic Village in Munich in 1972 and um, those who heard him speaking about, lecturing about his experiences quickly realized how deeply affected he was by the terror attack and this was something he 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 yeah he um he carried on doing research because and almost 30 years later he still worked on the topic and interviewed israeli eyewitnesses but then and now this is typical for norbert it it was too emotional for him to theorize the interview results he was too concerned, and we, we, we spoke a lot about this, he was too concerned that the authenticity would get lost. But when you could he hear him lecturing about this, this was Norbert, this was, he, he was in the lecture, he was uh, driven from an emotional side, uh, and this made him so special. Okay, um, be before, yeah, Christian in, in Qatar, I didn't forget you, um, Costas. But Chris, Christian seems that he, he wants to add on that. Only adding to that, Stefan, I think um, I think uh, whoever experienced Norbert teaching um, really um, got the spirit of, of the content he was he was uh, transferring. And this is also a little bit the contradiction to his publications. It had been mentioned that uh, Norbert um, published very significant papers and books But even more, and this is one of his um, big, biggest achievements and legacies, I would say, he always managed to organize books, bringing others together, um, getting compendiums uh, compiled and tailored. And um, those are the things like if you, if you, if you um, refer to his Olympic studies series, those are things which will remain forever. So I think there are two things. On the one side, the very emotional and, and, and very yeah, breathtaking uh, uh, and, and, and convincing lectures, which he did. And on the other side, the huge amount of publications he organized. And this will remain forever. Thank you, Christian. I'm talking about um, Olympic culture, about Olympic education and about Olympic knowledge, I just wanted to add a little story from the perspective of a, of a journalist. For me, Norbert Müller was the, the only eyewitness of the Olympic Games in Athens in 1896, the first Games of Modern Era. Talking with Norbert Müller um, gave me the feeling that He took me to Athens in 1896. Christian and, and Stefan and Maria and you all mentioned that. When we talked to him, very often he closed his eyes. He gave you the feeling that he was diving into, into that time. Athens, 1896, about the city at the end of the 19th century, the mood in the streets and the alleys. You can, you can smell um, the lamp meat, young people dancing through the streets. 
and in his eyes closed memories he took us all into the Panathinaikos Stadium to the Acropolis Hill showing with his finger to the northeast to the city of Marusi home of Spiridon Lewis first Olympic champion in the marathon race far away in the dusty air of the hot summer city you couldn't see Marusi of course but indeed you saw Spiridon walking through the streets and if you opened your eyes again you were sitting in the lecture hall of um, Olympia you were sitting in the plenum of a university or maybe you were sitting in his living room in in Mainz this was in my opinion the way he was teaching Olympic knowledge and how he inspired a lot of young people for Olympic education. This is our second topic after knowledge, the education he was teaching. And Stefan, you have your own thoughts about Nobert and his Olympic education. Yeah, thanks, so, uh, Holger. And uh, well, maybe um, as an introduction, it's interesting to, to understand that Pierre de Coubertin never spoke about Olympic education as such. Coubertin was referring to this as sporting education. But then in the 1970s, in the mid-1970s, it was Norbert who first introduced the term Olympic education to the Olympic Academy, uh, academic community and to different educational settings. Olympic education is for the practice and has to be uh, and has to coin educational sports settings at but also beyond the school level. And Norbert always applied this and stress the importance to establish the link between theory and practice. As to him, as to Norbert, Olympic education is a discipline from the practice and for the practice. And following his idea on Olympic education, one can say that he clearly enriched discussions on the application of Olympic education for various target groups, including pupils, teachers, students, but also athletes, coaches. As to the coaches, it was Norbert who, who said in, 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 um, um, in one of his publications that we have to include coaches to, to train them and to make them ambassadors of Olympic education, which was clearly a new approach in these days. Norbert never tired of disseminating new materials on Olympic education, information on new concepts of an implementing Olympic education into what he called, and Maria mentioned already, Olympic factories, yeah? uh, like schools, universities. Uh, and he, he, he started critical discussions on how challenging it is to address Olympic education in both a pragmatic and also in a convincing way. And his expertise was highly welcomed at, of course, as already mentioned, at the International Olympic Academy with its international, uh, with its unique and authentic international learning atmosphere um, and its session for diverse target groups. But it was also welcomed at National Olympic Academies and in different commissions of the International Olympic Committee. As to the letter, this is above all true for the uh, IOC's Olympic Education Commission and for the IOC's Commission for Culture and Heritage. When we are sitting on these commissions, uh, it's always said that uh, this has Oregon said by Norbert, and Norbert mentioned uh, this uh, already, but we have to expand on this. So this clearly uh, or evidences his, his important role at the IOC Commission's for Olympic education and culture. So, uh, if I understand you right, we are all workers in the Olympic factory. How did that feel uh, for you, Christian, um, in the in the space of of education? Um, how did Norbert educate you in in Olympism? I would not use the term factory in this regard because. Um, the educational approaches of Norbert had been too enjoyable to think about a factory, I would say. But um, whatever happened, uh, and I, I, I remember various seminars which we, which we had been organizing together, everything happened with surprises. So 
One surprise could be that Norbert came with a lot of juices, a lot of drinks and a lot of biscuits. And uh, there was the procedure always to distribute this to the students um, before they started to learn. And um, it was very much hands on. So for Norbert, it was very important to have activity sessions as part of his um, educational approaches. You had to, with reference to ancient Olympic games, you had to train the ancient disciplines. We made excursions. We went with the students uh, up and down ancient Greece in order to really experience what happened. And having spoken to uh, recently to two of his students who had been students more than 20 years ago, they remember all details, not only um, the experiences around the seminars, but the seminars themselves. So how can you be more successful as a professor and as an educator then if, if, if the content remains, remains active uh, after 20 years. Yeah, Christian, uh, I completely agree with you uh, and your meaning on factory. I think we have to translate it into Coubertin's mind and ideas. Uh, Coubertin was referring actually to Olympic factories. He even linked it with the revival or with his vision to revive the ancient gymnasium and also with his vision to create Olympic study centers. Okay, so we leave the factory aside, but in every factory you have a casino, um, which is very important to get um, to get food and, and some drink, drinks, which was very important um, for Norbert. So um, we may say that it was, a, it was an Olympic club. We are in the year 2022. Young people are talking about a club. And um, having Norbert Müller around, it was an all-inclusive service in that Olympic club. We are in the podcast. Let's talk about Olympic knowledge, education and culture, the heritage of perspectives of Norbert Müller. And we are in the topic of culture. And this is a very special link to the Olympic Games in, in Athens, not only 1896, but also um, when they returned to Greece, the Olympic Games in Athens 2004, Christian culture and Norbert Müller, especially in Greece and during the Olympic Games. Well, Norbert, um, we spoke about that earlier, the dissemination of um, Olympic, um, Olympic heritage, Olympic culture was extremely important. And um, we also spoke about the fact that he used to reach out to um, also popular media like um, broadcasting stations. And one of the means he loved, uh, uh, he loved to, 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 do, to support had been exhibitions. So in 2004, he organized an exhibition about Pierre de Coubertin and the Greek miracle, this was the title. And um, he was able to set up all these things with a, with a um, Pierre de Coubert, international Pierre de Coubertin committee. We will hear about that later. And um, so he brought um, real important heritage to Greece in order to make, to create awareness about Olympic culture, about uh, the heritage of the Olympics and Olympic history. So this was a huge exhibition he organized in Olympia. And later on, he um, set up more um, um, exhibitions for other topics, which were even touring around the world. So to use means, outside the academic circle was one of his um, main, main focuses to disseminate um, Olympic culture. Kostas. I would like to mention his research on cultural Olympiads that uh, I, I remember because I met him in different Olympic games that he came there with uh, 10, 15 of students and he distributed questionnaires and then he uh, published the research Uh, about the cultural Olympiads, which has, is a very, very important uh, work for the modern Olympic uh, Games. And we have also to mention that and add that to all his other publications. It, it has not written just only about Baron Pierre de Coubertin and the International Olympic Academy, but uh, he, he published also papers and books for the modern Olympic Games. 
He also had a had a focus on the on the global issue of the Olympics. I found an article that said cultural views of the Olympics, situs, altius, fortius, pulchrius, and humanius. So Norbert Müller extended the, the motto long before the IOC decided in 2021 to make Situs Altius Fortius commun community faster, higher, stronger and together. Stefan, this, this global view over the cultural experiences, um, is that a, a link that you mentioned with Norbert? Norbert tried to realize this in his presidentship of the International Pierre de Coubertin Committee. And exactly this is the link between Olympic education and culture. We talk a lot about Olympic education and knowledge transfer. And uh, Norbert realized this uh, with the International Pierre de Coubertin Committee. One clear column or objective of the International Pierre de Coubertin Committee is to preserve and analyze the works of Coubertin and to give them a contemporary meaning and contemporary understanding. But the same is true for culture. The, the International Pierre de Coubertin Committee is doing a lot to preserve the element of culture in the Olympic movement and to analyze it and um, to keep its tradition and always to link it with uh, Pierre de Coubertin. And Norman was really active there. Christian has already mentioned the, the research at the Olympic Games about the cultural Olympiads and but no it was also very interesting in preserving this that's why you also coined the Coubertin water Coubertin medal which was designed by the famous artist and sculptor Carlos Oswald at the front side it displays a nice portrait of Coubertin and Coubertin's motto Wallon Palifon Agir Ferme and this is engraved on the reverse um, side and The medal itself is available in different sizes and awarded in various academic contexts and also at the award uh, of the International Pierre de Coubertin Committee given to students and pupils who have attended the uh, international youth forums of the Pierre de Coubertin Committee, which were coined and which were established by Norbert in order to stress Olympic knowledge transfer. We are in the year 2022 and we are remembering Professor Norbert Müller from the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. We also remember Munich 50 years after Norbert was chief of protocol at the Munich Games in the Olympic Village. We are right ready for a conclusion, jumping to uh, Two places um, which were very important in Norbert's life and we are going to Olympia and to Kostas Georgiadis at the International Olympic Academy. Kostas. We, his students, will always uh, remember him for his enthusiasm, his passion and his dedication, especially during uh, the joint trips uh, to ancient Olympia, but also in Athens and uh, to the other archaeological sites, as you mentioned, Borga. And that is his uh, intangible legacy, which expands to many hundred of students that he taught and inspired throughout uh, the years in all these educational uh, trips in the Olympic Games uh, and also in Greece and in Olympia. Actually, the four of us, Christian, Stefan, Olga, and I, are the best example for that. We are the students of Norbert uh, Müller, and we carry this passion in us. Because Norbert Müller was able to pass on this passion, his passion to us, and many other students uh, around uh, the globe, the educational vision of Baron Pierre de Coubertin remains as relevant now as it was when Norbert Müller first ventured in the topics in the 70s. And we all know that Norbert was very happy and proud having Maria as head of the IOC Olympic Studies Center in one of his beloved cities in Lausanne, Maria. Yes, I think, well, I think so much has been said about 
him, his legacy, his amazing work that he has left to all of us. Um, I think in, in, in his honor and in, in the true purpose of Olympism, we're obviously uh, grateful. And I think that I am for the colleagues as we are on this call uh, and as the in representation of the institutions that were responsible for the Olympic Study Center of the IOC and uh, International Olympic Academy, Fiat Kubasan Committee and uh, Society of Olympic Historians, I think we're all devoted clearly as these people who have been so deeply impacted by Norbert to continue um, disseminating Olympic knowledge and contributing to the further development of, of his ideas and, to, uh, to, and using the works based on the works that he has left to us to further share this and, and use all our means to, uh, to continue in his thoughts. That's what we can do for him and it's great to be able to join forces with uh, our colleagues uh, in this regard. Thank you very much for having you all in the podcast. Let's talk about Olympic knowledge, education and culture, the heritage and perspectives of Norbert Müller. Companions were Maria Bogner from the IOC Olympic Study Center, Professor Stefan Vassong, head of the Institute of Sport History in Cologne, Christian Wacker, from uh, the museum, the sport museum in Qatar, Kostas Georgiadis from the International Olympic Academy in Olympia, Greece. My name is Holger and we are happy to have you here once again. And I think the closing words could be the ones uh, Norbert was always telling us, uh, the quotation from Pierre de Coubertin, voir loin, parle front, agir ferme. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.